All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I'm joined by Steve Richard, who is in Arlington, Virginia. How are you doing, Steve? Hey, John. How are you doing? Excellent. Excellent. And I'm here in, in, I have to say, it's downpouring in San Diego right now. So Again, it does happen. It's rare, but it happens. So uh, everybody gets a little uh, freaked out and didn't quite know and stare outside at it. Uh, but it is usually followed by 11 months of sunshine. So that's, uh, that's all good. So anyway, Steve is the founder and chief evangelist at Exec Vision. Uh, and before that, you, uh, you co-founded a very successful company, Voresight, as well. Uh, and now with your new company, uh, this is all about... Um, conversation intelligence platform, right? And you, you talk about insights to the performance gap. So first of all, for, for somebody who's never heard of it before, what is a conversation intelligence platform? Yeah, it's a, 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 there, there's a good question. In sales, the conversation's always been this black box where nobody really knows what's happening. We have metrics about everything, analytics about everything. Finally, because of the, the quality of speech to text and and AI ability to analyze the text, we can understand what's happening inside of conversations. And those are the insights. But then the gap is what we're seeing is a lot of people have some great data and dashboards and reports, but how do you actually get the reps better? How do you change their behavior through training and coaching once you know where they where they need to improve? Yeah, so how do you do that? Because that's always, the, um, as you know, we, we met before a long time ago when I was um, with Hothwaite, and it's always behavior change is the hardest thing to do because you can you can train people, you can give them the skills, and they can be as enthusiastic as they want about it. But it's really embedding it into their work practice and reinforcing it, and having people around to to coach and mentor them. That's where that's where a lot of it falls down. Yeah, that, that's right. And, and if you think about our brains, there's just an, an enormous amount of neuroscience behind us. Is, is there something called the forgetting curve where your, your brain, my brain, all of our brains, John, are wired to purge information. And it turns out it happens when we're sleeping. And it, and it happens with us not even being consciously aware of it. And one of the most dramatic examples to illustrate this, if I go to a salesperson at random and say, Get, tell me about the biggest deal you've ever won, they, they could kind of remember it, they kind of can't. If I get that same salesperson, I say, tell me about the biggest deal you ever lost. They remember it incredibly well. And the reason mm -hmm. is because the short-term memory in the brain is, is telling the long-term memory when, when you're sleeping. Uh, we believe it has to do with REM sleep, rapid eye movement, is telling the long-term uh, memory, don't forget this because this lesson could save your life or this lesson could kill you. So we're, we're doing this at an unconscious level. So how do you overcome it? To your point, repetition. You got to keep practicing and repeating and doing and as much as you know, people in our profession wish that everyone would do practice, that we would practice the way that you know, doctors practice on cadavers, the, the reality is that most salespeople uh, go out there and do it on real, real prospects, real buyers, real customers. So if that's the case, then let's inspect at the point of where the actual sale takes place, which is that conversation, you know, like, like a Zoom meeting like this, uh, a phone call, et cetera. Okay, so um, let's. And you, by the way, you're correct. Yes, uh, salespeople tend to practice on live bodies, uh, and and as I always say ad nauseum to people is, um, you know, you probably invest more money on your hobby and getting coaching for your hobby, whatever that is, than you ever do on the thing that puts bread on your table. I think. Um, so anyway, um, so tell me a little bit more then about about the platform and how it works in in practical terms. Yeah, yeah I'll I'll give you a quick story that'll illustrate it. I think. Um, of, uh, you know, look, it's, hard. It's, it's March 13th. People, we listen to this at a different time. Who knows what's happened? Yeah. Uh, coronavirus this week was, it just exploded. The stock market lost a third of its value to 40%, depending on the country. And um, what I did is within our system, I created something called a smart alert to be notified anytime there's a call that contains coronavirus or stock market or COVID-19 or those things so that I can be notified. And, and what, I, what I heard, so it's surfacing coachable moments. Um, what I heard is uh, a lot of our salespeople, really everybody, probably including me, no one really knows how to handle it. Nobody knows what to say. So, so I very quickly have called, uh, okay, we, we have to understand how we're going to handle this, how we're going to address it, and we're going to create coaching plans for each of you so that we can take you from where are you today to where do you need to be. And they all recognize and acknowledge that gap. So how do we get them across that gap and then create mastery? So once we've, we've done something as humans, several times 
and we've had mm-hmm. you know feedback throughout that process of some form, uh, like riding a bike. The feedback is you fall off the bike or you don't. When you're done, it becomes like riding a bike. You know, you 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 don't have to think about it. You've achieved mastery in that subject, and the next time the next uh, you know cataclysmic event happens, we're prepared and we know how to handle that situation. But right now, we don't have that collective consciousness in the sales community. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a really you know dramatic example. You can you can chart out and understand. You know, if, if there are, are topics that are all of a sudden, uh, you know, rising in importance and they're, they're appearing in your calls, you know, the spike that I saw was just dramatic. It was just people were talking about Corona like the beer, little blips. And then finally, yeah. boom, it just goes right through the roof. So we, we need to be prepared to address that. Yeah. So basically, then you can find patterns and you can see things that are coming to the surface that need attention. And then um, and then obviously, obviously, the next part about it is you need to be able to act upon it. So you need to be able to interpret it and then figure out what the solution is for whatever group of people you're coaching. That's right. And and I'll give you something that, you know, I've I've spent a lot of time with um, field sales, inside sales teams, B2B, B2C, as well as call centers. Um, And I never had the opportunity prior in my career to work in call centers and just observe what it's like. And it's really fascinating. One thing that they've got us all beat on in in the, you know, the rest of the sales world is it really good with having a rubric or a framework of, of a good call? This is what a good call constitutes. Now, it's not a script. We're not, we're not looking to be scripted. That's going to ruin us as in sales. Instead, what we want to do is find what are the seven to 10 key behaviors in every call type and think about those as like jazz. You know, it's, uh, you know, as long as you hit those notes, John, I don't care how you improvise. That's your personality. That's what you bring to the table. We do know because the data proves when you hit these notes, your probability of close is higher. I mean, going back to a Huthwaite, for example, the implication mm-hmm. question, that was a, a classic one that still to this day, I, I hear people talking about that. Everyone talks about it. Everyone trains on it. Very few salespeople do it. And when we measure it in our system, we see very, very few you know, companies that are consistently doing good implication questions, even though we know it comes with a higher correlation you know, with, with success. Yeah, and I think that's a great point that you just touched on um, because I think that is where where there's a big gap is that people don't know what good looks like. And sometimes, uh, unfortunately, their coaches or their sales managers may be often salespeople who've defaulted in that into that position or been promoted into that position. They don't necessarily know what good looks like. They may know how they do it, but they don't know something, uh, what good looks like, something that can be, as you say, can be codified in some way. And it's not scalable. So, and it's the, the 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 situation we see again and again is old old salesperson who's successful, new salesperson comes in. Let's have them shadow the veteran. Later on, the new salesperson's going, yeah, wow, that, that boy Susie is amazing. I have no idea what she does, and I certainly could never replicate that myself. You know, so now you're right back to square one. If anything, you've just created more confusion. I think the the biggest thing that that sales leaders need to do. Um, and, and this one drives me nuts, John. It drives me nuts because every, mm-hmm. every sales leader is around for two or three years. We all know the data. And, and then yep. when a new one comes in place, what do they do? They bring in a new methodology, a, a, you know, their new thing. And the people are still just getting their, their sea legs with the old methodology, just starting mm-hmm. to get it and actually get some results from it. And then all of a sudden, boom, you got a new methodology. And it's like, it's like I was a really good Buddhist and now you want me to be a Catholic? You know, well, which, which one am I? You know, what am I supposed to do here? So we have to have the leaders together and we have to have them be on the same page for their definition of good, on their same page for the expectations of the sales process and document it. Scorecards are such a simple thing to do. And then flip the coaching paradigm on its head. I think, I think a lot of times managers, of course, they all say, I have to call, call coach, especially. I have to coach, but especially call coaching. It's always the one that falls by the wayside. And the reason is they say they get too busy. But here's the deal. If you get your reps to listen to their own call and score that call, then the likelihood of them changing is much higher because people value more what they conclude for themselves and what they're told. So we can can get the people to change just by getting them to do this action and holding them accountable to that action. Uh, Yeah, because uh, I'm absolutely 100% agree because, um, as we say, I mean, most people are – even people who people who are really good often tend to be unconsciously competent, right? They're really good at what they do. But if you, as you said, if you ask them what makes you good, uh, they won't really be able to tell you. 
it's not until, as you say, you start to actually listen to yourself or see yourself or do some of that uh, uh, examination and analysis that you start to pick up on some things. So, so talk talk to me um, typically how how this would work and what do what are some of the great insights that you've seen salespeople uh, discover about themselves when they actually hear how they operate? Yeah, um, in terms of operationally how it works, we see most most of the companies we work with will adopt a rhythm where everyone listens to two of their own calls per week, one good, one not so good. Or, or even one. It's it's one of these things. It's John. It's a tiny a tiny little bit consistently done goes a long long way. Uh, it's it's like the spicy pepper of of the sales world. You know you don't have to do pipeline reviews uh, or you have to sorry you have to do pipeline reviews all the time. But sometimes they're very long. You don't have to make call coaching be very long. Be very short. Um, I, I, we see that if you do small groups, that can be a, that can have a big impact. Who you coach matters. There's a lot of research out there that shows don't waste your time coaching your top performers or your low performers. And that's yeah, that's where we spend all of our time, focused on the middle 60%. So if you do something like get six B players into a room and do a call review session and a coaching session, you can create far more impact in many cases. Uh, another big thing we see people doing is, uh, is the reps themselves become peer coaches. I would, I would recommend a certification of some form. Uh, sure. and, and, and then let them take some ownership of it, or you do manager swapping. So, you know, team A manager goes over to team B, team B manager to team A. It takes that, you know, weirdness of the person's compensation being tied to the results off the table and you can focus on what matters. Uh, and then we also see call competitions. That's been a big one. A lot of people love to run, run a call contest. Uh, it's a fun way where you, 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 you reward and, and send good quality. And that's how you build your library of the best calls too. Uh, especially for, there are some people who, you know, maybe they don't blow out their quota by as much or they miss by a little bit, but boy, they're having, they're creating really good customer experiences through their sales process. Very, very high quality, um, not the most quantity. Let's reward those people for the things they're doing right. Yeah, no, I, lo- I love that. What are some, just some anecdotal examples of things that individual salespeople have discovered? Because I think that would be fascinating for people. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I the, the, the biggest thing that we see, when you ask any sales leader, okay, so What's your biggest challenge with the calls? Everyone goes to discovery. They always mm-hmm. go to discovery. And, and, and when a salesperson listens to their own discovery every single time, and they have the aid of one thing we, we do is these um, trackers that can track keywords by topic. So there are words that are associated with strong discovery, and then there are words that are associated with, with quantifying it and then implications right. and things like that. So, so when, when they see, wait a minute, Next to discovery, there are only I've only done it four times in this call, and I should have been doing it 20 times in this call. Light bulb. And then you ask them the question as the coach, what discovery questions would you have liked to have asked that you didn't? And when they listen to the call, they go right here, right here, right here. And we have them actually comment right on the timeline of the call, right where they. So I said, look, uh, uh, Kanika, Alex, I want you to just write a comment on the timeline of the call for where you would have asked a question. And when they do that and they go back later, they hear it. Another big one is closing for next steps. Um, People are notoriously bad about this and they do the whole, all right, John, uh, call you next week. Sounds good. Call you next week. Get it scheduled. Find out who else is involved in the decision. Um, Find out what else have they purchased that's like this. I mean, have they ever bought anything for the company? Does the company trust them to spend money, basically? Um, There's so many questions you need to ask. Is there a security review process if you're selling technology? People are horrible about that. People are also pretty bad, and actually, this is one I'm I got to get better at is uh, is setting the agenda in the beginning. Mm. Um, I'm I'm I I tend to just start talking as opposed right. to saying, "All right, look, in this call, we're going to do this, this, and this," and assuming that makes sense, then the outcome will be this for you. Is that is that right? And then checking with them, and then, and actually, finally, I'll give you one more: is is something you're doing a tremendous job of active listening. Uh, mm-hmm. People are. Uh, very bad as a general rule of thumb at having their own agenda that they sort of plow on with and not hearing the the question that was asked correctly. Yeah, and I think that one is is critical because so much more is being done online now, like virtual meetings or um, uh, you know phone calls. That you know it's a lot less you know face to face. And I think that's where you have to be exceptionally good at active listening because let's face it, we can get distracted very easily. I could be on a sales call with you and. 
asking you questions and suddenly something's flickering over on my screen and my attention has gone over there. And now I have no idea what you actually just told me back. I mean, I may have heard it sort of, but uh, so I think we have to be increasingly disciplined on that. And also the point that you made earlier about the uh, continue, what we used to call a health weight, the continuation um, versus uh, an advance versus a continuation as you said, uh, right. when I call you up and, and the end of our sales call is me saying, okay, so uh, Steve, I'll, I'll call you next week, right? Between now and next week, you're not doing anything as, as the buyer. So it's just a continuation. There's not this sale hasn't advanced in any way. But I go back to my manager and I say, great call with Steve. We're going to talk again next week, right? <laughs> Yeah, there's and and not having that mutual plan of action, you know, have a yeah. plan and, and a plan necessitates that the, the seller does something and the buyer does something and they hold each other accountable to it. And that's I think a way that to think about it that puts you on the same level as the as the seller so frequently, especially the younger sellers. I say, you know, who has more power? And they all universally say, Oh no, you know, the buyer has all the power. I'm gonna have none of the power. Well, if you really believe that, how how are you ever gonna be able to pr produce and create true value? All all you're doing is is you know shucking products that's that's not yeah. going to be beneficial for anybody no absolutely and to be honest in nowadays i mean customers are so you know they say well the customer is all the information well that's true but they're also overwhelmed by that information so if you can cut through the noise and bring them some insight you know they're, they're going to love you power shifts to you i know and john so to build on that um i'm going to yes and you uh sellers have more information i never hear any Talking yeah, heads, that's you know, like, like if you go to Google, let me give you just a, a for instance that nobody knows about this and it's, it's sitting right there in front of us and it's free. If you go to Google and you Google someone's name, put quotation marks around it, put their company and they're probably going to have a lot of results for you. You're going to have thousands yeah. of results. The next thing you do is you go to tools, you change tools from any time to past 24 hours or past week or past month. And then boom. You get relevant stuff about that individual that comes up almost all the time. And if the person's not available online very much, they're kind of a more junior person or they're just like IT people aren't online very much. Go do that same thing for the company or write the company and then information technology in quotes. And the same thing will come up. You'll find their CIO has spoken somewhere. You'll find their technology plan for 2021. You know, and I, I think I think especially with this, the craziness with the coronavirus and, and, and what the world is going to turn into, it's critically important now more than ever, to your point, that we enable our sellers to do these video conferences, to be able yeah. to have information in advance. And we're not doing a good job of it right now. We really aren't. No, 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 we're, we're not. Absolutely. Um, something we uh, instituted a while back was because uh, we do a lot of selling, um, you know, virtually is that uh, we said we said to everybody, all of our salespeople is switch on your camera. Even if it's only at the beginning of the call, uh, and it doesn't matter whether the the prospect switches on theirs or not, doesn't matter. A lot of the times they will, but just switch on your camera and say, "This is who I am." Humanize the experience, and then you, you can switch it off if you want, or you can stay on. But it's things like that. It's 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 starting to break down those barriers and embrace the technology and realize you have to work a little bit at it. It's just not going to happen for you. You're going to have to work. And as you say, now with the coronavirus and that. Uh, people are going to have to learn more how to connect through these kind of mediums. I'll give you a quick story. I spoke with a company this week and they sell to uh, pharmaceutical and biotech companies, a lot of overseas in particular in Europe. And previously mm -hmm. their whole business was built on their uh, sales people really are more like subject matter ex experts sure. being embedded in the locations with mm -hmm. the client. They can't do that anymore. It's not possible. So there's, kind of frantically trying to get these people to do some of the basics that you and I take for granted. I'll tell you one thing that now granted, this is my, my late mother's art behind me that I, I cherish, but I, I should get a backdrop, right? I should get, I should have executive, just like your sales talk. There's so many simple things here. And here's the other thing. Nobody cares what you look like. You know, I was on, on the, I just did a zoom a few, an hour or two ago with a guy in Austin, Texas, and he had his two kids because the school had closed running around and he was all disheveled. And he said, I would never look like, th at, like this on a customer call. I think as a society, that's going to start to change quickly. You know, and I certainly appreciate the fact, you know, that, that, you, that you dress and conduct the way, yourself the way you do. I think that people are gonna be much more understanding because guess what? Almost all of us are gonna be home for two weeks to a month to maybe more. I mean, we don't even really know what it looks like right now. 
So I, I think mm. we're going to start focusing on the essence of the conversation and what matters a lot more than, oh, I don't like the way my hair looks. So I don't want to turn my camera on. Yeah. Yeah, tell exactly. No, I I agree with you. I think people are more forgiving. And I just think as people get more used to working at home, they'll get into a rhythm. And I think then they'll also realize that, um, in fact, it may be tempting to roll out of bed in, in your sweats and stuff. And uh, But in order to actually build yourself up into the right mode, it's better off that you do it like you are going to work. And I think people will, will, will gather those skills. They go and realize that there's actually a, an energy boost uh and a productivity boost to conducting yourself like you are in the office but but i agree with you i think it's going to be a great learning curve for people and i hope and one of my hopes coming out of this is that uh companies start to embrace more and more the concept of remote working and i and i'll be honest with you um back when we met when i was at hotway i was not in favor of people working from home i couldn't stand it i wanted everybody in the office i didn't believe in it but i have evolved in my thinking i mean the the technology and and the infrastructure has evolved too but now i think why would why would i force somebody to live and say for instance if you're headquartered uh, you know in silicon valley why would i force somebody to work live and work in silicon valley one of the most expensive places in the world why wouldn't i want people to live and work where they want to where they can have the quality of life they want to because i'm going to get i'm going to get more productivity out of it yeah, we're we're all on the dawn of this of this uh, big experiment, and um, you know I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll give you something that I'm about to post on LinkedIn. I haven't posted yet, but um, I don't know. Do, did you remember Jim Ninavaji, the late Jim Ninavaji from? Uh, he was a serious decisions analyst. Wonderful guy. He knew yes. uh, mm-hmm. yeah. ones. And, um, he actually he sadly passed away. I wrote an article about it on LinkedIn in, in just a routine surgery. But anyway, uh, Jim. Uh, used to talk about, you know, his, his terms, asynchronous call coaching, uh, mm. asynchronous being obviously not uh, in the same place at the same time. And uh, I, you know, asynchronous call coaching has never been a very sexy subject. You know, it's kind of like a sure. nice to have, to have until now. Uh, and that's like, it's kind of my, you know, my joking, my dark humor around the situation because I've had in the last 24 hours more inbound than I can remember because previously, if I can sit next to you to coach you in the moment and do these kinds of things, you know, it's, I can I can get a lot of gain from that. You can't do that anymore. I mean, now that everyone's working from home, um, and we're in a situation where if they're a seasoned professional and know know how to conduct themselves, you're right. And and I was on your train too. I I was never in favor of this ever 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 mm-hmm. for years. Um, when you're dealing with a younger professional, there's a lot of people out there who are scrambling because their teams are quite green, and there's a is yeah. a great amount of collective learning that happens by you know, everyone sitting in the same close confines. We see that, but we're going to have to find a way to replicate that without being in the same place at the same time. So I I think that, um, you know, I think I I give you one other prediction. I predict that people stop shaking hands, which is, you know, I'm I'm sad about it, but I also think it's probably a good thing. It's such a strange custom, you know, that I somehow trust you more if I touch your hand or like, (laughs) why I don't, but, but I don't think our, you know, my kids will know they're four, six, eight, and 10. I don't think they'll know what what it means, means to shake a hand it'll almost be like a landline you have a landline what why yeah no, exactly now that's an interesting one you yeah, haven't thought about that but yeah you're probably right you're probably right all right well listen uh, steve we're coming up against the end of our time all of steve's information all the information about exec vision will be in his contributor bio but before we go steve just tell people a little bit more about what your company does and how they can find out more about you yeah i'll, t- I'll tell you a great resource we did this uh, and we're going to bring it back again it's called call camp so it's the only web, it was the only webinar series at the time, The Innovator, where we broke down real sales calls, recorded sales calls for what works and what doesn't. And actually, it'd probably be great for us to have you as a guest, because I think you could do some uh, excellent call review and breakdowns with us. And we, we focus with a different expert every, every month, uh, uh, and we, we listen based on a different topic. So we're going to have an upcoming one, of course, on uh, coronavirus and some of the issues and how to handle that in a professional way, in a proper way. But if you go back into the archives, there are so many different topics, you know, lead follow up, cold calling, uh, discovery, qualification, solutions, presentation, demo, closing, customer success, you name it. Uh, it's called Call Camp. If you go to our website, execvision.io and go to resources, you'll find all of them on demand for free, free sales training for everybody. Wow. That's fantastic. And yeah, I, I highly encourage people, maybe take a step back uh, and think next time you go out to practice your golf swing or your tennis stroke or whatever it is you do, 
Um, just ask yourself, maybe I can give up one hour of this and use it to do training on the thing that puts bread on my table. Hey, just a thought. All right, listen, Steve, this has been great. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeline, CRM. See you all for another expert interview really soon.